Um, so, I am here to talk about my research that I do here at PPU at Chalmers, and um, the title I have chosen to explain what it is I do is Designing Socially Sustainable Production Workplaces Through Systemic Human Factors and Ergonomics. And I promise I will pick apart this title so it will be easy to figure out what it is I am trying to put together here. So, let's spend a few minutes doing just that. So. As you can tell from beginning to end, design is in some way involved here. And that has to do with my background. I come from a master program in industrial design engineering, which has really colored the way I do my research and what I am interested in. Then socially sustainable production workplaces. Social sustainability sort of came into my life after I had finished my PhD studies and I was informed that uh, this is something we don't know so much about here and uh, maybe you could take a look at it and maybe get to know something and we can all learn from it. And it's been quite a trip. It's taken me five years to realize that the most common thing said about social sustainability is that it's very, um, it's the least understood pillar of uh, sustainability and uh, unfortunately that is what all the literature keeps repeating so this misunderstanding and uh, mysteriousness doesn't seem to be uh, moving anytime soon then we have the final part of um, uh, no the second final part of this title is systemic I really think it's crucial to work with these types of problems from a systems view and then finally, through hu systemic human factors and ergonomics. That's, my, uh, that's the core of my research, that I work with human factors and ergonomics. And that means that it's the science of work, and uh, it's meant to support uh, both the well-being of humans and the uh, productivity and efficiency of work systems. So, with that said, all of us work in a context here. We all have a, an area of application that is uh, close to home and that unites us with our colleagues. And for my part, this context is future production industry. I'm looking at the, hum the human and uh, work-related uh, side of future product production industry. And of course, a few uh, expectations come with that. So first of all, uh, we see developments that make us think that future production is going to be much more connected, much more mobile, and much more digitalized. So the machines are going to be talking to each other, the operators are going to be able to monitor what's going on at a distance and at all times of day, and there's going to be a lot of decision making based on that extra ubiquity. Another thing we're seeing is that products are becoming more and more complex, and of course that gets mirrored into how we do work in these production systems. Then there is pressure to both, well, both be sustainable, so as not to overload the planet, but also to be innovative and competitive. And that means that companies cannot um, disregard the economical side of things. They have to stay uh, so competitive that their business can keep on thriving, as that's kind of a prerequisite for doing anything about your work systems. And then finally, a lot of new business models for how to uh, supply machines and equipment are happening right now. And that means that there is a bit of a challenge coming up for how to do maintenance. Who should be doing it, who should be learning about it, and who should be supplying it. So that's kind of the general picture that I'm working with. But um, this all together means that humans remain an important part of the system. Even though there's a lot of digitalization going on and a lot of automation that humans have always been talking about being a danger to jobs, all these complexities mean that we still have to keep humans in the system and we have to safeguard them even more than we have before because we have some additional things coming up. One of them is an expected skills gap, that we think that the new things that you have to do as a human in a production system require something that not a lot of people have time to learn in school if they even go to that type of training. And the industry, uh, you'll hear this a lot from the Swedish and European industry, is wondering how they're going to attract young people because fewer young people have been born in recent decades and um, that is beginning to show in the available workforce. So they're wondering how are they going to attract the young and what are the expectations this group has. At the same time, we have older populations in general, particularly in the Western world, and it looks like we're going to have to keep them on a bit longer in order to not lose all their competence at one fell swoop. So uh, how does production industry meet that challenge? And you'll also hear particularly Swedish 
industry talking about the need to consider greater diversity. If you want to include more people in your future workforce, then you have to consider what they need and how their, um, how their prerequisites are different from what you're used to. And um, th there's one big thing regarding the care of humans, and that is that the current sick leave reason that is the number one in Sweden is actually stress and psychosocial ill health. So because the number of physical injuries have gone down so much, people are thinking that, well, maybe we don't need human factors and ergonomics as much anymore because we've taken care of that. Uh-uh, as Hans Rosling likes to say. Uh, because when you lose people in particular to these types of problems, then the recovery times are extremely long, and this is very, very costly, both for the companies and for society as a whole. And that means the proper care of your human elements in your system is crucial. We don't have so many to play with anymore, so we have to make sure that the ones we have stay motivated, want to stay on in production, and don't injure themselves or their capacity or will to work. So the operators of the future have kind of this coming up for them. More complex jobs, more demands, and they are going to have to make a lot of critical decisions that are based on expertise and information that they quickly get, have available to them. This means that training is going to be quite important, and who is going to supply that training? Because there's one way to do it through schooling, but if you can't really catch everyone you need that way, then the onus is on the companies to start providing this training. And then questions come of how do you distribute the knowledge that the most experienced workers have to the ones that have less experience? How do you get that interchange? Part of it can be solved with technology, part of it can be solved with uh, formalized training, but a part of it is also culture, what happens between people. And then if you want to keep people, you have to ask yourself, what is a future good life or successful career going to look like? What are the expectations on that? What would make someone stay with your company? And a, as a final thing, what kind of technology will be expected as a part of being able to do work? Particularly, how do you communicate? That is going to be a rising star among uh, different types of um, research questions in this field. But I want to say this. Performing optimally as a human in a workplace is not something to take for granted. This is a dynamic property of a human, and even if you have someone who is very engaged and very knowledgeable, that person can have ups and downs, and those ups and downs can be either mitigated or exacerbated by the work system they are in. And that work system includes both the technological side and the environments where they collaborate with other workers. So you have to understand what the right working conditions are to support humans in this sense. You have to understand human needs and what are the prerequisites and motivators for them to want to do work. You have to understand how the technology is supposed to support those needs and the organization around. And also, what are the reasons that someone would want to stay engaged at this uh, workplace? I really particularly want to pick apart socially sustainable production workplaces because, like I said before, this is um, kind of an up-and-coming aspect of sustainability and I think it's been a privilege to get to do research where I get to understand what it's all about. But I've found that it's a bit challenging to take this knowledge and then impart it, for example, to my students for a number of reasons, which I will go through now. So there's a few things you need to know about social sustainability before you take a pile of it and dump it on a factory. So if we go through the very brief history of how sustainability first uh, came into being and then how social sustainability evolves out of that. Oops, sorry. There we go. Um, in 87, uh, the world... Um, uh, sorry, the UN called together the... Uh, WCED, the World Commission on Environment and Development. I'm not sure if I got the letters right. And um, they had to have a discussion globally about how do we make sure that developing countries are brought to the same living standard as developed countries without overloading the planet. That was the concern of the 80s, and this was kind of at the top of people's minds. The planet is being polluted, we have landfills, and we're putting way too much pressure on the Earth, and how are we going to make sure that everyone can sort of improve their lives, but not at the cost of our planet? So the Brundtland Report, which was named after the chair, Gro Harlem Brundtland, um, brought forth this famous definition of what sustain sustainable development is. 
development that meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. So far, so good. But of course, because the uh, center of gravity was so much toward the environmental side, what happened with the social aspect was that it tended to be about what are the conditions in uh, developing countries that we want to lift up to this uh, standard of the West. And um, a lot of related terms uh, and abbreviations exist related to the social aspects of sustainable development. So you have social equity and social equality. You have the triple bottom line, which has the business perspective saying that you can't only consider the economic bottom line. You have to also consider people and planet. Then we have so corporate social responsibility, CSR, uh, a rather well-known concept, and a lot of companies have their own department or deputies working with this. And then social responsibility. The thing is that all of these terms, if I went through them with you, would imply that a lot of the concerns that they cover are organizational, and they also sort of meander back and forth uh, on who are the humans that we're taking care of. So particularly the last two, corporate social responsibility and ISO's uh, social responsibility, they tend to be about stakeholders both within and outside of the factory, with a, lot of, uh, with a lot of attention to customers and suppliers as well as the people working within, so to speak. And if you compare the key themes and domains that came up early when they started talking about social sustainability, they've changed over time. So on the traditional uh, starting side, you might say, then a lot of the concerns had to do with basic human rights. What makes a basically good, decent human life? So things like education and equity, as in fair access to the rights and services of a community, your basic needs, including food and housing, human rights, eradicating poverty and social justice. That stuff is hard to bring into a context where you want to make socially sustainable uh, production workplaces. So, of course, a shift has had to happen, and that one has drawn the attention over to demographic developments. Who are the people that are available as a workforce in each country? How do they get empowered? How do they have a voice? How do they have an identity? How do we safeguard their health and safety? How do we make sure that their social capital is not harmed at the same time as they are allowed to mix with others and gain from that? And how do you support their quality of life? Th those are kind of the new concerns that are kind of tied to social sustainability. And this gets a bit closer, but it's still not very actionable. It's hard to do something about these things directly for an engineer to understand what to do. But if we zoom in on the demographic challenges, uh, particularly for Europe, because um, that, that's kind of the area that I've been studying, these are the, these are the factors that are uh, getting, their, uh, getting attention turned toward them uh, by the industries. Um, the aging population I've discussed before, that you might need to keep on your elder, uh, elderly workers for a long, longer time. You want to attract young people into your workforce because fewer of them have been born. And that means there's a general competition for workforce in most sectors. And it's expected that there will be a greater demand for elderly care workers. And of course, that's kind of at odds with each other. Um, and then we also have all these uh, unpredictable developments that perhaps were not thought of five years ago that have now resulted in a lot of people moving to a different place very rapidly. And some Companies and countries and communities wonder how can we how can we meet that challenge that suddenly we have all these new people who don't speak our language but uh, how do we offer them a decent life can they work can they work with us and one of the starting points for a lot of my social sustainability research has been this graph and what it shows is that in 2012 the population of Europe had mostly middle-aged people. That, that was the majority of people, and they are also con uh, uh, logically the majority of workers in production. So what happens when time goes by, all of these bars are gonna start moving to the right, and it means that the people on the far right, the people who are uh, older, they will go into retirement, and uh, then these in the middle move over there, and soon they will also be ready for retirement. But with that few people having been born in the last few decades, you can see that there's quite an imbalance. There's not enough of them to replace all the people going into retirement. 
Now, granted, it's not certain that that many jobs are going to be needed exactly where we think, and production industry has to learn how to interpret this, like what will happen if we can't choose from quite so many people, but at the same time, we don't know how the job development will look. So th this is a challenge to interpret this as what are we going to do in production industry. And I've spent, um, I calculated that uh, 11% of the years of my life I have spent dressing up as this bar chart. So I, I'm trying to stop now. But um, if anyone wants to see that, there's a YouTube video. It, this is at TEDx in Gothenburg in 2013. So the design challenges that you can derive from these developments are that you need to design workplaces so that age and language differences don't impact your work. That it's not a problem that you don't see as well or don't hear as well. And perhaps that there's more imagery around for you to interpret rather than words in a language that's unfamiliar. And uh, videos can also, of course, uh, help there. So your ability as a human worker needs to be supported from those perspectives. And of course, designing to attract and include new workers. As I said before, Swedish uh, industry is very interested in diversity. And uh, they even had an event with uh, Teknikföretagen, which was uh, called Cash is Queen, the Profitable Diversity. So they, they, they're very, I mean, they're business people. So obviously they want to keep this interesting by flavoring it that way. But, you know, I think it speaks for itself that they had a theme day about it. And they had me dress up as the bar chart and talk to them. So, yeah. Um, and uh, more things you have to do are to engage people so that they want to stay. So support creativity and problem solving and innovation to ensure that there is staying power in the job that they are given. And then there's that question, how do you meet generational expectations? There's a lot being said about millennials and digital natives as, um, as kind of a mantra that they expect certain things and they expect technology to do certain things and be everywhere and to work in a certain way. I personally think that millennials will grow up to be adults uh, at some point, but at the same time, we live in a world where design is constantly changing to meet our expectations. And that goes for any generation now, if we're going to have a truly diverse workforce. I was part of an EU project that helped me get into these thoughts about particularly European socially sustainable manufacturing. So the acronym SOSMART was actually Socially Sustainable Manufacturing for the Factories of the Future. And for those of you who wonder how that acronym works out, there's a lot of letters you can pick from the middle of words. Uh, but what we arrived at as a uh, good starting point from there was that finding socially sustainable manufacturing is a balance. In the middle, you have the individual who gets to decide, do I want to work here? Do I want this type of a future and career? Is this a good, is this a good qualitative life? And on the other end, that could tip this human towards, uh, you know, deciding to go there or not, uh, you have the commercial interests, who obviously are the companies, and they have their perspective of how do we stay profitable and competitive while providing the right training, retaining the right competence, and uh, making the best possible use of the humans we have. On the other end, you have the societal uh, drivers, which are usually communities surrounding these companies. And they're looking at how do we keep our population healthy so that we don't have high sickness costs? How do we make sure that there's infrastructure for them to get to work and uh, where they're supposed to be? And uh, what is the appropriate education and appropriate wages that we should legislate about for this to be worthwhile? So there's all these different things happening at the same time, and one of them shooting up might, um, might prove very fatal for any of the other aspects. So this is really complicated stuff. And if you're an engineer, maybe this is not a very attractive starting point. But if you're a researcher who is also a bit of a social researcher and a bit of a management person and a bit of everything, even then it's a bit hard to grasp. Uh, I've asked the people I am talking about under that description. Now the thing is that the main problem with making anything socially sustainable is that most of the challenges are described at a global level. And the problem is we want to bring it home. We want to bring it down to a factory level where it's actionable and we can take care of these concerns in a way that says, yes, we, we had that problem and now we have done something to address it. We have basically ticked that box. But this is a challenge for whoever is tasked with bringing those concerns home to the factory and fixing this. So 
Research is still needed to figure this out, for sure. And I would like to propose that we cannot do this with a reductionistic analytical approach. We need to have a systems view because these problems are wicked. They are super interconnected and poking at one thing will end up in an effect on the other end. And that complexity has to be dealt with. And that has to be dealt with in a multidisciplinary fashion, I think. So having just one competence about knowing that this is complex won't take you far. You have to engage people who do know stuff about the details and engage them at the right time and together with the right people. Also, because the problems are on a global scale, it becomes difficult to decompose the concerns that are currently in literature. So I personally think right now that if you want to learn about social sustainability, you should spend your time 50-50 reading the literature, but also going out to see what is being done now about this. And particularly, the construction industry has gotten far with using the term, and it's also because their product, buildings, is really, really centered around how does this interact with society. So there tends to be a societal flavor if you go around looking for stuff to read, but at the same time, we need to bring this into the factory if we want to keep our workers. Um, I have fast-forwarded to the type of system I think is necessary to know about. So, socio-technical systems mean that there are humans present. And if we see these humans as important, crucial elements to making the system work, you must be aware of some things. Humans can react on their own and change their mind over time. So, they are self-aware and they can make decisions. Humans are always learning, they are dynamic, and if something comes from the outside to influence them, for example, through other people they're working with, then they are bound to be influenced and, again, maybe change their behavior. And that behavior, in turn, might make the system's goals um, be in danger or become reinforced. So the behavior can either make the system very resilient and self-repairing. So let's say there's a, uh, some sort of crisis and there's a good attitude in the company and people know what's, uh, what's right and they know what they can sacrifice, then usually that system will survive. But if there's a tendency for, um, if there's a tendency for negativity and not wanting to help each other, then of course that will be a very bad precondition in a crisis of some kind. So if you view socio-technical systems, the classic literature tells you that you need to design them in parallel from four different perspectives. And these perspectives are, of course, the technical subsystem. This is where engineers feel very at home. This is where you can uh, work with the predictability. You set up something, you put in an input, out comes an output that you can count on. And the problem with technical systems that are purely technical is they will always break down. They're always dependent on the strength and... Uh, 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 what's hold fast yet? Uh, uh, they will depend on the strength of their materials. So when they break down, um, then you you have to fix it somehow, and the system cannot per persist. But outside of this, if you have human operators or humans deciding that this is going to be so, then you have a personnel subsystem. You have to understand who is going to ensure that these inputs and outputs work, and uh, the question of who comes down to uh, the competencies and when you start transferring the knowledge between people and how you communicate. Then we also have the work design subsystem. And of course, you're beginning to realize, I hope, that all of these are intertwined and changing one will change another. And this subsystem is about what are these processes that we have decided on and how do they all come together? What is decided that we should do and to what quality criteria? And then finally, you have the environment. And I don't mean the environment as in nature. I mean the working environment and the preconditions for performing. So these questions of what, who, how, and under what conditions, you can't really change one without having an impact on all the others. That's kind of the core understanding of working in a socio-technical systems view. So this beginning is very philosophical. I promise I will get to the... Uh, practical nitty-gritty of how this gets expressed later, but I haven't talked yet about my favorite part, which is human factors and ergonomics. Now, the thing is, if you're a researcher in that field, you tend to become kind of smug. And it's, it's a bit sad, because uh, it doesn't always sit well with other people that you think you're saving the world by being good to humans. So I think it's, it's good to remember that this is also a scientific discipline that can come down to earth and communicate better, and I hope I will now. So human factors and ergonomics 
is actually two terms that are officially defined to be equivalent. So there might be some slight variations depending on where you are in the world, how these two terms are interpreted. So some places will be more familiar with saying ergonomics, others will be more familiar with saying human factors, and some, some people will put certain meanings into either one. Some, some people think that human factors is more the cognitive processing side, understanding things that uh, astronauts need to do and so on. And some people interpret ergonomics as purely physical. But remember, these are equivalent terms and they are filled with a great diversity of meaning. So let's do another little brief history of this. Um, in the 1940s, when World War II was raging, uh, before, before the war, it had been kind of the jargon that in factories you had able-bodied young men working and they were strong and they never complained and you could make them put up with anything. But in the war efforts, they had to send all of these able-bodied young men out to fight. And suddenly the realization back home was, oh, we still need a war production and it's urgent. We really need people to work with producing things. Where do we find them? And it turned out after a while of thinking that what they had to choose from was injured men, uh, previously overlooked uh, groups such as Afro-Americans and women. And uh, I'm usually uh, very fond of showing a propaganda video of the 1943 manpower efforts that the US government was driving to show my students that this was when they started caring about adapting the workplace uh, to a new diversity of people. Very much because there was this preconception that we cannot allow women, decent women who are meant to be uh, loyal wives into this dirty environment where everything will overload them. So I'm going to show a little clip of how the US government attempted to change this um, attitude. Tens of thousands of women are already at work in aircraft. More are being added as fast as they apply. This solves the breadwinning problem for many families whose men are at war. The government's policy is that women should get the same pay that men get for similar work. What do you do with your money? Save it. Where necessary, machinery is adapted for women's use. When a hand drill weighs heavily on feminine muscles, the lazy arm drill is introduced to take off the strain. As women are urged to take factory jobs, the army assures them this will not necessarily affect the draft status of their husbands so long as they're maintaining a bona fide family relationship in the home. Okay, now that might seem a bit quaint, and I think it's worth seeing because every time industry is faced with a new challenge, then a variation of this type of talk comes up. So right now we're having a lot of industrial videos popping up saying, I think it's very important that we involve the millennials in the creation of our new workplaces, the new personalized workplace. And uh, I have a reference for that, but I actually want to get back to my brief history. So in the 1940s, what became interesting with the lazy arm drill to take off the strain and so on was the physical characteristics and anthropometry as in body sizes and so on and the perceptual capabilities of people. How, how did they change the technology to meet those requirements? That was kind of the you know, for better or worse, the World War II effect that we got a more diversified workforce into production and it became accepted so that once the war was over and the able-bodied young men, some of which were not so able-bodied anymore, came back, um, this was kind of accepted that, well, some ladies have become widows and perhaps they should stay on and work to make a living. And in other cases, well, well they seem to be doing a good job. This same video has a wonderful sequence showing uh, a woman embroidering, which they segue very gradually into someone wiring a circuit board. And they say that uh, women will find that uh, housework and uh, factory work are not so different after all. And some things they do even better than men. I, I think it's kind of a kind of a fun thing to show the students that um, that's kind of where these thoughts started from in the West. But 20 years later, after the 40s, um, there became a lot. There, there, sorry, a lot of developments happened with computers and robotics, and a, a new fascination and a fright among people was kind of born. That they were wondering, are the robots going to take all our jobs? And these computers scare me. They're uh, they're thinking so fast and I don't know what that's going to mean for humanity. So those fears, which are still voiced today by Stephen Hawking and a lot of other uh, knowledgeable people, they originated 
quite a long time ago. But what happened because of these developments are that ergonomics started looking at cognitive abilities. What is the human brain's limitations of how much information it can take in, how much information it can sort, how much memory can we uh, load before we start forgetting things in the short and the long term? Can we understand when something is urgent or not? So the psychological factors also kind of came into this. What happened under duress and stress? And what happens if you're an expert versus a novice? Still very, very crucial knowledge that we can use today. But this, of course, influenced the, uh, the shift from adapting technology to human beings' physical characteristics to what are the demands that technology places on humans? And uh, it's mostly in computer interfaces and control rooms that this is really heavily expressed, where there's much more of that rather than the physical side. So that was the second generation of ergonomics, the cognitive generation, as opposed to the physical. Then another 20 years later, then a lot of ergonomics researchers realized that we're not getting all the way through. We are not reaching the workplaces with the knowledge we have. We know so much about the body and what it needs, and we know so much about the mind. Why are we not succeeding? And after some thinking, they realized that, well, we need to consider the context of where the work is happening, because there's a lot more influencing what's going on. When you make a decision to work a certain way, you're under pressure by the organization and the groups that are around you. So the macro ergonomic generation of the 80s kind of feels like it's very yuppie flavored. It started considering the context and stakeholders, who was interested in the processes surrounding better ergonomics, because they would influence it with arguments of, well, we have to manage our personnel and we have to save money and we have to be productive and efficient. And these demands were a reality that definitely affected ergonomics. And of course, you can see there's a precursor here coming to the necessity of systems thinking. So the macroergonomic generation of ergonomics, it started looking at these things. And now systems thinking, I think, is quite crucial for a lot of ergonomics knowledge. But another 20 years later, uh, there was a need to define this finally. And what happened was that the International Ergonomics Association made a definition, and it's twofold. Ergonomics, or human factors, is the scientific discipline concerned with the understanding of interactions among humans and other elements of a system. So, just pausing there, it's a scientific discipline, and it's the profession that applies theory, principles, data, and methods to design in order to optimize human well-being and system performance. And that last part of the definition is usually the one that gets thrown up, that what is ergonomics about? It's about uh, optimizing human well-being and system performance. And I think that's a good catch-all. It's, it's that that makes ergonomics useful, but it also makes ergonomics extremely demanding. You have to know so much about so many different things in order to cover it. And that's why, again, this needs to be multidisciplinary in order to capture all these things. And then, now I've run through a lot of theory and a lot of background, and you're probably wondering, so what do you do? And uh, my perspective is important here, that I have a certain attitude in my research that I try to keep consistent. And it comes from what I did in my doctoral thesis, which was called Organ uh, Ergonomics Infrastructure. By that, I meant that there are different pathways by which someone who knows a lot about ergonomics can make a difference on the factory floor. And one of the main conclusions I brought with me into my uh, work is that the power and access to influence a workplace doesn't necessarily rest with the person who knows the most about ergonomics. And this is kind of, a, this is kind of an organizational political uh, conundrum because Ergonomists who tend to know a lot about these things and can make some pretty smart decisions about how to change a system, they might be trapped organizationally in a perspective where they are expected to come when someone is already injured, uh, make sure that their medical and rehabilitation needs are met, and then after that they might not have such a large opportunity to change the system so that the risk is removed so that not more people get injured. Of course, depending on where you are, some ergonomists get to say a lot. They get to be in cross-functional teams. Uh, but we can't count on this everywhere, so an ergonomist's outreach might be limited organizationally. But an engineer, an engineer is trusted to do continuous improvements. That's kind of their job, that if they see something worthy of improving, they should just do it. So that mandate and that trust is something that could be a really good leverage for changing these work systems into something socially sustainable. 
but you need to uh, you need to then reach these people with this knowledge in an accessible way. And um, my other background that kind of came sneaking around and stayed ever since my uh, master period was the industrial design engineering background. From there, I had a very heavy influence saying that design of anything, product or uh, work system, should be user-centered, as in care about the needs and the prerequisites of the human. And the other thing was design is multidisciplinary. Don't get stuck in one silo. Talk to others, gather the data, and then make design decisions. So that means that all the research I have been discussing right now is at a crossroads. I'm trying to combine all these four areas into a coherent whole. And what we want is to join these two. And this is, perhaps we're not all the way there yet. That's what I'm working on. So socially sustainable workplace. I say that we have to influence the design processes in order for anything to actually become realized. So we can say that what's up top in this picture are the effects we want. These are the, um, the, the overall ideas that we consistently come back to. And at the bottom, we have the possible solutions, the realization level. So social sustainability is married to systems thinking. I think it's impossible to work with it if you don't have that. At the same time, human factors understands that systems thinking is very crucial, or at least some human factors and ergonomics uh, professionals. And it's also naturally coupled to workplace design processes because that knowledge should be employed into a system in order to stay. Otherwise, you're just going to be working as a medical professional. So what happens is, in order to join all of these, we kind of have to go through the others. But in the end, I think that with more multidisciplinary research, we can arrive at that point. And then perhaps we can strengthen that bond between socially sustainable work design. So to enable this, you have to translate social sustainability concepts into something that works in a workplace perspective in production. You also have to have the socio-technical systems view because otherwise you'll keep implementing technology that ends up not working because you forgot that it had a ripple effect on another subsystem. And I also think that it's crucial that human factors and ergonomics knowledge needs to be integrated into the design. And like I said, that's the job of an engineer, typically, or a designer. And engineers, I think, then need to be trained in having this human-centered orientation, just to understand how valuable a human is when they work at their optimum and how to keep that going, how to not wear it out, how to not waste it. If, uh, if we use the language of not wasting human potential, I think we can get somewhere with the engineers. So down to the more concrete side, how does my research support these developments? Well, first of all, no researcher is alone, and I am part of a group I'm very happy to, to be part of, and they're whispering together up there. Um, this is the competence group ergonomics, and we, ha we don't call ourselves a formal research group and uh, keep the uh, uh, normal hierarchy just yet of uh, uh, research leader and uh, PhD students. Currently, we're kind of working on what are the areas where we can place our efforts. So it's me, and it's... Professor Roland Dörtengren and uh, Dr. Anki Falk and Dr. Lars Ola Blygård. And uh, we're, we're trying to become cross-departmental as far as that's possible. So we want to engage everyone at the department, uh, both from pr product development, production systems, and design and human factors, so that we make sure that we don't lose this perspective of thinking systemically and using all this multidisciplinary knowledge. We think it can benefit most of us very well. When I say systemic human factors in ergonomics, I'm trying to use the term just to kind of really reinforce that we're not looking at simply uh, component by component human factors, where you study just one reaction in a muscle or just one response to a stimuli from a cognitive perspective. I want this to be on the level of we want to change work systems. So, of course, it needs to zoom out a bit. And the aim of such a, um, an endeavor is to realize high-level effect goals such as social sustainability by using human factors and ergonomics and system systemic design approaches. And what we do more is that we try to develop theories and methods to uh, put together these things. So combining human factors, ergonomics, and 
socio-technical systems views of designing in parallel from multiple perspectives at the same time. And then the idea is to serve and support an engineering and design community primarily, which is why we keep, uh, you know, uh, coming to visit product development and uh, design and human factors and production systems with our different ideas. So how we work is that we study from a more classical ergonomics perspective, specific workplaces to identify how can they be more socially sustainable from a human factors perspective. We also develop systemic methods and frameworks that designers can use, and we study stakeholder perspectives in workplace changes. And another thing we're trying to do is establish communities of practice with the people that we try our methods with. And uh, so far, industry and alumni are part of that. We have a bunch of... Um, uh, master students that have now tried some of our methods and we try to get them to talk to each other afterwards and stay connected around the use of those methods because no method that you employ in a socio-technical system can really um, stay intact. They will t the users will teach you as the developer where it needs more work. And uh, oh, I forgot to mention that I'm also working with Eva Simonsen in the, uh, the group, uh, specifically with one method. Um, and we need to integrate this research, of course, into our courses. So one concrete example is that I did some stakeholder involvement studies in my research on Canadian ergonomists and engineers. This kind of stemmed out of my doctoral period. So th this was kind of looking at what are the power-based tactics and uh, how do they persuade other people that their way of doing things is worth implementing on the factory floor. I also did a study on involving users in ship bridge design, also a workplace where you need to be productive, using mock-up models. So this was comparing three different types of physical representations and trying to see what, which one gives what kind of feedback from users. And it turns out there are differences. The nice thing is that it, we've been able to use the knowledge from this in other projects. So. Uh, but first, I have to tell you about a stakeholder analysis method that has sprung from my doctoral thesis. This is a uh, mapping method that says that everyone who is involved in the change of a workplace has a certain role in relation to that change. Some of them will facilitate this, some of them will document it, some will be the ones paying for it but then standing back to let others solve it, and then some of them will be blocking it. That there's reasons why this cannot be done because you are endangering my perspective of this workplace. And it's a practical method that, of course, uh, looks a bit messy at this stage, but we've been trying to evolve it over time and organize the visualization of who does what. And it, as usual, it turns out a matrix is the best option because then you can work with post-its. So um, I'm not terribly bummed about that development, but that's how the change agent's infrastructure method looks like today. And we've been able to use this and the 3D modeling knowledge in the project 3D Silver, which is funded by Vinova. Um, this project is about making decision support for layout of new workplaces and also um, evaluating the ergonomics of them using human simulation. And the, the nice thing is that we were able to map all the stakeholders of this project using the CHAI method just to kind of get an idea who should we be involving in our studies and then we also had some background knowledge given what kinds of feedback do you get from different types of 3D models. And of course, these virtual models are a different story because they are either in a virtual reality format that is extremely immersive or they are on a screen where you're kind of detached from it. So there's more to learn there for sure. We've also taken our uh, studies to a very different type of workplace, thanks to collaboration with the product development department, particularly Magnus Evichon's group. They invited me and Lars Ola to do a um, work environment study of this environment, which is uh, Swedish um, natural stone production. These are the types of granite that go into um, paving stones and... Uh, uh, gravestones and so on, depending on the quality level. And this is a very dangerous environment. There's a lot happening, there's a lot of noise, there's a lot of dust, and there's a lot of heavy, heavy work. And some of it is helped by advanced equipment, but a lot of it is done by hand. So we were there and we were checking out what are the ways that this, been, uh, this environment can become more socially sustainable. And of course we did some uh, change agent infrastructure mapping there of who is involved in what type of project. 
So there's a publication available about that method, but I see I have to speed up a bit. Also, as a contrast, I've been involved in a log uh, an ergonomic study of a logistic setup, and as it turns out, regardless of whether you choose a flat or a tilted pallet to improve ergonomics, this is a reality. This uh, unpredictable way of uh, choosing a work position when you're going to empty a pallet. It, this is stuff that still happens in production industry today. I think it's good to be reminded of that fact that we think it's so good, and then you go out and have a look and you realize there's still more to be done. And then finally, one thing that I'm proud of working on, this is really where the design perspective marries the systems thinking and the human factors. And uh, you can use this for supporting sustainability. This is the ACD3 framework, which is a tool and a framework for product developers or production developers, uh, where they can work their way through different um, abstraction levels of design. So you can really think about what are the overall effects we want to achieve, and then work your way consistently with your design decisions down to the realization level and the component level, making sure that you have internally consistent decisions that don't end up messing up uh, the whole thing after a while when you realize that, oh, this won't work in this type of organization. Or, oh, we can't, we can't have that beautiful handle we thought because the screws have to be from that supplier. With this method, we think you can catch these problems in good time. And we've been trying it with our um, master students in their product development and production development projects so far. And this framework is based on the question of when and how are design decisions made. And originally it was made for human machine interface design. And Lars Ola had a very big part in formulating that side. And I am working primarily with developing this for production system design. So more socio-technical system with a personnel uh, aspect and work design. Uh, so there's two variants of it and we do workshops in either one, depending on the audience. And the idea is that the problem solving should be centered on what you're doing, the use, the actual actions around the thing you're trying to build, rather than an individual user, where you'd kind of get stuck in their needs and maybe not so much the systemic stuff going on. And if we look at the, ver the variant for production, then this is kind of uh, the variant we use in workshops. And we try to tell our users that this is meant to have you talking in a group about who at your company is responsible for what, and when do you have to meet up and discuss so that your design decisions don't collide with each other. And you can also translate the framework into a, a systematic sequence for how to work with requirements. Because this method says that you shouldn't decide all your requirements at the beginning and then slavishly follow them to the end. Because you don't know as much at the beginning as you do as the project, project progresses. So the idea here is to work systematically with refining your requirements using this philosophy. And we've employed this at a number of master thesis works so far. So um, we, we've had it tried out in a number of different products, and uh, recently we're beginning with production system development also. And uh, my most recent uh, uh, thesis workers actually had a run-in with a late change to uh, the production principle. So they had spent 15 weeks uh, developing a single line to very successfully put together a new product. And then when there were five weeks left, the company said, oh no, we want all our products to be produced on the same line, by the way, so probably we can't use what you did. And they used ACD3 to do some damage control. They were able to evaluate how much of our solution can the company still use. So it wasn't all a sad story. They saved it in the end. So there's a few publications on that too. So finally, um, I try to spread the word about what I do through do, doing workshops at other universities. For example, this is a CHAI works, wor workshop at KTH. The students are doing stakeholder analysis. Uh, this is me at Ryerson University, where I did my uh, PhD uh, exchange. I uh, still try to keep in contact with them and work with their human factors group. And I've done an ACD3 workshop at uh, DTU in uh, Denmark. And uh, they seem very interested in it from a systems design perspective because that's the name of their department. I've been to some public and industrial events speaking about the challenges coming from social sustainability. 
And uh, th this is the event where uh, Teknikföretagen had their Cash is Queen, the uh, profitable diversity uh, theme day. And uh, I will be speaking with Industriellt Utvecklingscenter i uh, They're interested in how to combine automation strategies with the challenges of social sustainability. I don't believe I'll be talking about the first half of that, uh, uh, of that theme, though. And then I do some industrial collaboration with some specific companies, and uh, one of them is a uh, supplier of ergonomic workplaces. So they're very interested in knowing how can we argue for this being worthwhile? How do we say that this solves the future problems? And then we also have a management consulting firm who works specifically with sustainability and how to make companies and organizations more sustainable. And they've been uh, trying out in practice the uh, possibility of using ACD3, so we're going to run a workshop with them on their particular projects. And then finally, uh, the pride and joy of my life, and it's also been a headache, but I'm very happy about it. I've written a textbook in systemic human factors and ergonomics, and I use it in my courses for my uh, master's students in production ergonomics and work design. So. This book goes through ergonomics, both at the individual, the group, and the um, uh, environmental level. And I try to teach my students that all of these things come together, and if you know a bit about all of them, then you can probably put together a long-term successful solution. And it's important, of course, to highlight that the economic performance is crucial to be able to argue for, because otherwise you can't really give ergonomics a place in modern industry. So with that said, this is what I do, and I'm very grateful you came to listen. Thank you so much.